Finding Jack Charlton, the incredible story of Jack's time as island manager is available on Blu-ray, DVD and digital download from the 23rd of November. On the 25th of June 1990, as David O'Leary approached the penalty spot in Genoa, a nation held its breath. Jack Charlton's Republic of Ireland had survived 120 goalless minutes against Romania. They had converted all four of their penalties in the shootout, and with Pucky Bonner having turned Daniel Tomofte's spot kick away, O'Leary had the chance to put the Irish in the quarter-finals of the World Cup. O'Leary scored, of course. He lifted his penalty high into the net, and as the rest of the Irish squad streamed onto the pitch, the green and orange tricolours danced in the stands. It was one of the greatest sporting moments in the country's history, framed by the benevolent joy that has become Ireland's stock in trade at international tournaments. But this was a new identity, one that didn't exist prior to Chelton's reign and the second act in an extraordinary life. Jack Charlton was appointed by the Republic of Ireland in 1986. Ten years later, when he left his position and retired, he had taken the country to its first European Championship in 1988 and its first World Cup in 1990 and four years later its second in 1994. Not only had the face and personality of Irish sport been changed for good, but the country itself was in an entirely different state. The island of the previous decade had been dismally bleak. Between 1980 and 1987, the country experienced political and economic crisis manifesting in rapid changes of government, an unemployment rate which approached 20% and a raft of social issues, including exponential rises in heroin use in Dublin and the continuing violence associated with the Troubles. It was a country that the young left in pursuit of a brighter future, and by the end of the decade, 206,000 more people had departed Ireland than had arrived. It was into that context that Charlton arrived, and he was another Englishman that the country didn't want. As Paul McGrath recalled on hearing of the appointment, I was disappointed. After all that had happened in this country, why would we have to have an Englishman of all people to run our soccer team? And so were some of the supporters. Ahead of Charlton's first game in charge, which ended in a 1-0 defeat to Wales, a banner hung in the Lansdowne Road stands. Go home, Union Jack. But when Charlton passed away in July 2020, the Irish would mourn him as one of their own. McGrath, who was as talented but as troubled a player as any within his generation, would pay tribute to a man who became like a father to him. And he wasn't the only one. Of course, Charlton was no establishment figure. He was a former miner. And when Arthur Scargill, that great enemy of Margaret Thatcher's, led the NUM out on their bitter strike in 1984-85, it was, Scargill remembered, with Charlton's unwavering support. Jack's wife Pat had worked in a miner's kitchen in Barnsley during the strike, while he loaned his cars to picketing members. And he was no shrinking violet either. In time, Eamon Dunphy would become Charlton's fiercest critic, but on his appointment, however, Dunphy was positive and prescient identifying the qualities which would help him to withstand. Charlton is different, a non-conformist who is honest, belligerent, insensitive and bloody-minded. In other words, the right person to be an Englishman in Ireland at that time and in that position. And he was also innovative. One of the backbones of the success would be the grandparent rule, which allowed third-generation immigrants with Irish ancestry to represent the country internationally. Andy Townsend was born in Maidstone, but won 70 caps for the Republic as well as captaining the side at USA 94. John Aldridge, born in Liverpool but qualified through his grandmother, went to all three international tournaments under Charlton, and Ray Houghton, who scored the solitary goals in the famous wins over England and Italy in 88 and 94 respectively, was born in Glasgow and had actually represented Scotland as a youth international. And there were others, but collectively though, they represented an inversion of the familiar migration trend. These weren't people leaving Ireland for the sake of an opportunity, but those returning in that same pursuit. You've always exported people, Charlton says in the upcoming documentary about his life. It's nice for them to come back and help you out now and again. The result, and constant throughout Charlton's decade in charge, was a hard-working team. Ireland were physical and direct. They aimed to play long and into the space behind a defence, and then press the ball. It wasn't pretty, but it was extremely effective and, in keeping with today's trend for pressure, arguably very modern. Charlton's side beat Brazil, they never lost to England, winning one game and drawing three, and they would consistently punch above their weight. And, as they did, their fans followed. Accounts of Irish supporters at international tournaments contrasted with their English neighbours, cultivating an entirely different sort of reputation. 
And it was deliberate, remembers actor and comedian Ardell O'Hanlon, who was interviewed by Colm Heaney in Jack Charlton, The Irish Years. We wanted the world to perceive us as very different to the English, O'Hanlon recalled, and one of the ways of marking ourselves out abroad was by adopting a more carnival-esque attitude. As fans from other countries behaved like invading forces, the Irish became welcome guests in foreign cities. For the team, that often meant playing in seas of green, in New York or Genoa, and among forests of Irish flags. Now, to some, the Irish tricolour, with its Catholic green, its Protestant orange, and its band of white in the middle depicting peace between the two, was a Republican symbol entwined with the horrors of the past. In the present day, it's associated with Italia 90, the takeover of Giant Stadium, and the burgeoning sporting identity that the Charlton era helped to create. And there are some who argue that Charlton's leadership helped to instruct Ireland's tremendous economic recovery, that period of rapid economic growth known as the Celtic Tiger. But what seems more likely is that Charlton helped condition the national attitude, that the success of his sides on the world stage created an optimism which was then nourished by EU subsidies, low corporation taxes and foreign investment. But there's nothing tenuous about Jack Charlton's sporting legacy. One of Sir Ralph Ramsey's immortals in 1966, but a catalyst for Irish pride and restoration during one of the darkest periods in the country's history. Now, the full story of Jack's time as Ireland manager is beautifully documented in the new film Finding Jack Charlton. It's a portrait of an extraordinary man, and it's by far the best sporting documentary that we've seen all year. Not only do you get a fascinating insight into the recent history of Ireland, but we particularly enjoyed hearing about Jack's tactics as a manager. He was a trendsetter and some of the football you see today can be traced back to him. Like all the best sports documentaries, this film is not just for football fans. It's intense, it's enlightening, and it's deeply moving. And it's also now available for digital download as well as on Blu-ray and DVD. If you watch one film for the rest of the year, make sure that it's Finding Jack Charlton. What's football about? You're at Wembley Stadium and a ball is crossed from the right wing and you go boom, boom. That's his medal. People say to me, was that the most memorable day of your life? Joys and management are totally different to Joys as a player. He's not the same Jack. He's dementia. I couldn't remember a lot of the memories. And it's a shame because he's had some good memories. Jack, perfect goal! My dad made notes. I'm a batterer, a fowler. <laughs> what are you clapping for? On players, family and tactics. We kept them all. Ireland was engulfed in war and conflict. Nobody would have given you odds that you'd have an Englishman manage the team. Our way of playing is completely new. If you didn't like it, tough luck. My brother Jack was an uncompromising character. Jack said, if you don't get off the bus today, you'll never play for this country again. This is a time when it gives you the opportunity now, not only to go. Come on. You could feel the spirit of the camp. What did it mean to lead Ireland to the World Cup finals? You're talking about financially. <laughs> it was an extraordinary adventure. My bag of nerves here. We're going to go. I'm going to win the World Cup. Another magnificent chapter in Jack Charlton's career. I think a lot of you do in Ireland. No idea. Bobby did what Bobby wants to do. I love them. Now hit me, come on! Rub it! Never assume they know and understand. We took that flag back and flew it with pride. Jack Charlton did that. He's done more in his lifetime than people would do in ten lifetimes. Be a dictator, but be a nice one.